Thank you, ma'am. Moving ahead to our next lecture session. As our second guest speaker, we have with us Honorable Professor K. Satyamurthy, Director, School of Life Sciences, Manipal University. Professor Satyamurthy holds a doctoral degree from Cancer Research Institute, Bombay University. Sir is an eminent scientist with expertise in the area of epigenetic variations in populations, genomics of cancer, pharmacogenomics, host pathogen interactions, and genetics of human diseases. Sir has held various prominent research positions like Research Associate at Kansas State University, Division of Biology, Manhattan, Senior Scientist, the Vista Institute, Philadelphia, Senior Scientist and Professor, Manipal University, Director, School of Life Sciences, Manipal University, till date, as well as Adjunct Professor, University of Queensland, Australia, to date. Professor Satyamurthy, sir, has more than 300 research publications, 20 review articles and book chapters, 18 national and international patents to his credit. Sir has presented over 150 invited lectures at both national and international platforms. Professor Satyamurthy, sir, is the editor and reviewer of research articles for major international scientific journals on molecular and cell biology. Professor Satyamurthy, sir, is the recipient of Lady Tata Fellowship, Bidla Fellowship, Wesley Fellowship of Kansas, USA, Dr. P. A. Kuroop Memorial Endowment Award and Dr. T. M. A. Pi Endowment Chair Award, Manipal University. With this, I now invite Professor Satyamurthy, sir, for his lecture entitled Targeting Epigenetics for Disrupted Homeostasis in Cancer. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. And at the very outset, <clears throat> let me uh, congratulate Dr. Uh, um, Rupa Mazumdar for having invited me uh, to this uh, AICT sponsored online uh, faculty development program, which is being conducted at the uh, uh, Noida Institute of Engineering Technology, Engineering and Technology uh, on the theme of the cancer genomics in uh, uh, healthcare system. Uh, very much obliged for having invited uh, me to deliver a, a talk to your audience. And uh, let me try to upload my slide. Uh, very good afternoon. Good morning again. Uh, can you see my slides, please? Yes, sir. We yes, sir. It's visible. Huh. OK. Yeah, thank you. Thank you once again. Um, Welcome, sir. So um, this slide is basically tells you why homeostasis is important. That is in relation to the title of my talk of uh, targeting epigenetics for uh, disrupted uh, homeostasis in cancer and uh, uh, homeostasis is uh, the tendency to uh, achieve equilibrium against various uh, natural and environmental factors in fact. and this results in uh, uh, dynamic equilibrium uh, where the continuous changes keep on taking place and yet the steady conditions are main maintained as you can see in this uh, in this slide. So let me just, um, uh, as you are aware, a, a number of uh, regulatory mechanisms are employed to resist these changes and uh, uh, in the, we're in the influenced by both extrinsic as well as intrinsic uh, factors. The homeostasis which can be maintained by each organ or by the entire body given any given time. <coughs> So any negative feedback uh, happens when the normal effectors are in and sensors are in fact are disrupted. Effector can be the influence or impact of uh, external as well as intrinsic factors. 
and the sensors are nothing but the cell response elements which include receptors. So uh, there are certain some examples which we uh, usually look at and which is commonly studied that include, for example, the glucose homeostasis, cancer homeostasis, the uh, blood homeostasis, organ homeostasis, among others. So the core uh, homeostatic machinery can involve any number of functions within the human body. And, Excuse uh, me, sir. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, so your slides are not in full screen. Um, uh, slideshow is we are not able to see. It's not a slideshow. Okay. No. So, sir, actually, multiple slides are visible. But it will just do. Yes, and now it's okay. Now it's fine. Again, it's. Uh, excuse me, sir. If you just press F5, it will automatically come in full screen. You can just uh, press F5. A5 on the keyboard. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, ma'am, the keyboard. Can you see the slide now? No, sir, it came oh, for... Line here. Sir, now the single slide is visible, but it is not in the slide show mode. Yeah. Now just give me one second. I'll just fix it. One second.
Ah, sir, if you're comfortable, then you can go in this mode also. We can see the PPT. Uh, hey, I'm sorry, so I hope you can see it now. Uh, yes, sir. It's not fine. Yeah. My apologies. There was some issue no, with the presentation. So, but still, I'll try and finish uh, within time. Um, so, I was talking about uh, the core homeostatic uh, uh, machinery, which uh, involves number of events that can happen within the cell, and these include the majorly the genome stability, protein um, uh, proteostasis, energy homeostasis and immune homeostasis and calcium homeostasis. These are just some of the examples which in fact are shown here. On the left hand side is what is shown here is the potential uh, genetic variants that would in fact influence the homeostatic status and some of the examples which are provided here. These include the inflammatory and metabolic processes, the insulin resistance which you see in especially in uh, uh, diabetes and the dysfunction of the pancreatic beta cells and many other clinical uh, manifestations which it can happen when there is a disruption in the normal uh, homeostasis. So, um, uh, what is uh, shown in this slide is some of the examples of uh, uh, genomics of homeostasis, where some of the genes are in fact are shown here, and uh, these include their interaction with the nucleus as well as mitochondria. These are just uh, in, uh, examples of few genes. There are hundreds and thousands of such genes which in can play a significant role in the uh, in the maintenance of uh, homeostasis per se at the cellular level as well as at the organellar level. At the organellar level, we are looking at the mitochondria as well as the nucleus within the interplay that happens uh, between these organelles within a given cell. And some examples are in fact are shown here. And uh, one of the extrinsic factors which uh, uh, is shown here on the right hand side is actually the induction of the DNA damage as an example. So in induction of the DNA damage by various events, uh, mostly extrinsic as well as intrinsic events, can lead to a disruption of maintenance of normal homeostasis. And that would turn leads to number of effectors and these include attempts by the cells to repair the cells and or pushing the cells to the cell death processes such as apoptosic processes or even to push the cells through a senescence processes. So all of this can occur um, as a part of the maintenance of a given cell in the normal state, state and when it is disrupted actually it leads to tumorigenic process. So uh, within the evolution of the tumor per se, so there are a number of other events which in fact need uh, to support the evolution of the tumors. The tumor and microenvironment, in fact, plays a major role in the pathogenesis of cancer. So, what are these tumor microenvironments? So, the tumor by itself cannot grow on its own. It requires several factors, and these include the angiogenesis, the growth of blood vessels, and more importantly, the support of the cell cells surrounding the tumor, which include the fibroblasts, which in fact make the cell and tumors grow. At the same time, there are inflammatory cells such as macrophages and neutrophils also bring in some of the chemotract and proteins to be able to control the tumor growth. So on the whole, the microenvironment in fact produces what we call it as intratumoral heterogeneity within the tumor and give rise to a number of these events which is shown here um, uh, in the circle. We just, uh, number of events which in fact can uh, occur within the cell and these are not necessarily limited to all the given cell at a given time. This can be tumor specific. All of them need not happen simultaneously, but this can happen one at a time, thereby bringing about the intratumoral heterogeneity. These intratumoral heterogeneity, some of which can give rise to the persistence of these cells uh, despite the despite the extrinsic factors which in fact are controlling them and subsequent, subsequently go on to divide proliferate and make tumors. 
and that is why we see more often that a tumor within the person is not necessarily same as what we see with the others. There is a significant difference between various type of tumors which evolve within the individual as relate to the overall incidence of tumors which we see in the general population. And these are in fact supported by number of events as a tumor microenvironment process wherein not only the cellular events but also the molecular events such as the cytokines and growth factors and the chemokines they can influence to be able to modulate the ECM and then may give rise to the tumor cell. So uh, the cancer stem cells are also playing a very important role and under normal circumstances the can cancer stem cells they renew themselves and they form progenitor cells and then these progenitor cells also renew themselves and then when they acquire the mutation, they can have mutated protein cells. At the same time, if they are not mutated, they can terminally differentiate into whatever the fate of the cell that may be for that given tumor. On the other hand, mutated uh, cancer stem cells can also uh, uh, form the progenitor cells and they cannot revert back into terminally differentiated cells, but rather they can become the cancer cells and these are characteristics which are shown here. So the knee, uh, stem cell niche with relation to the normal cellular homeostasis is lost and the cancer stem cell niche is in fact is acquired. And what are the some of these characteristics and these include the uh, multi-drug resistant phenotype wherein they do not respond to chemotherapeutic drugs. They can acquire a highly invasive phenotype called the epithelial mesenchymal phenotype, uh, epithelial mesenchymal uh, transformation in which the epithelial cells get transformed into mesenchymal cells and they become highly in invasive. And because of the overexpression of the some of the molecules, protein molecules, the drug mo uh, drugs which are treated to these cells are effectively thrown out. And they have a kind of a altered DNA repair mechanisms wherein the number of DNA repairs or damages which occurred within the cells are, are effectively are repaired. And these include the base excision repair, mismatch repair, non-homologous combination repair. So all of them can add on to bring in the additional mutational status within the cells and these in turn allow them to survive and proliferate. There are also certain targeted mutations which we see and they also can be eliminated because they are not uh, amenable to grow in the given environment. So if you look at, if you take an example of a seed and soil hypothesis, wherein in, part, in order for the seed to germinate, you need appropriate soil. So in order for the cancer cells to grow, it also requires appropriate soil and that is provided in the form of fibroblasts. The fibroblasts are in fact are highly, um, highly robust cells which surround almost every single tissues and cells in our body and they are effectively transformed to be able to serve the tumor cells. So the tumor cells produce proteins and other factors which it can influence the fibroblasts and which in turn the fibroblasts now become slaves of the tumor cells and thereby provide them with appropriate materials for them to grow within the, uh, within the given site or given, within the given tissue. And that is why this is called as cancer associated fibroblasts. So these effectively uh, transformed cancer associated fibroblasts secrete number of growth factors which include paracrine and autocrine growth factors and which support the growth of the cells, growth of the tumor cells because these tumor cells are eventually are going to go through the angiogenesis and invasion, attract chronic inflammation and evade the immune cell cytotoxicity, uh, reduce in fact the T cell activation so that they, they are prevented from removing from the site and as well as other immune cells which are prevented from eliminating the tumor cells. This seed and soil hypothesis in fact is well supported by who is the master and who is the slave within the cancer microenvironment. So apparently the cancer cells that take over as a role as a master and convert the surrounding fibroblasts into their slaves to be able to provide them with appropriate paracrine and autocrine growth factors to survive on a longer duration. Now, uh, what are some of these events which in fact govern and make them grow um, uh, in a tumor environment and within the tumor cells and that bring about and that brought about by the variations in the genome. So there are a number of uh, genomic aberrations which in, in fact can occur within the given tumor cell during the process of carcinogenesis or the tumor growth and these include 
the single nucleotide polymorphisms, as you may as you may have already aware of, where there are approximately about eight million SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms exist within a given cell, and their altered location within a given set of genes can provide them an advantage to proliferate. Similarly, the cells are made up of approximately about 30 to 60 percent of the cells which are composed of the repetitive sequences and these repetitive sequences in fact are, are providing uh, support for the tumor cell to grow. Most importantly, the copy number variations by definition, it means that there are more than one copies of a given sequence or a given gene within the cell and they significantly in fact promote the growth of the tumor cells merely by the effect of gene dosage which happens within the tumor cells and thereby bringing about their transformation. One of the most critical events that we often see and most often in, in all the cases see in the tumors is the DNA methylation as a part of the epigenetic event. DNA methylation is a process in which it is able to silence the transcript of a given gene by methylating the specific cytosines within the nucleotide, thereby silencing the promoter and altering the gene expression of a given gene. We will go into this detail a little bit more as we speak on. And more importantly, more, more recently, the newer concepts of RNA interference, so, so miRNA is also part of the epigenetic event, and that also brings about the human variation. And all of these together are specific and uh, individual to a given person. And most many, many times or more often, you don't see commonly associated with the, all the tumors at all the time. There will be some percentages of them are in fact are occurring between the individuals and they can contribute to the progression of the tumor. So there are three major events which we talk about. Uh, the DNA methylation, as I mentioned, that it's an addition of a methyl group into the cytosine residue within the promoter of a given gene and thereby controlling the gene expression at a given time. The chromatin uh, modification or the histone modifications which bring about compaction of the nuclear, nuclear DNA into either euchromatin or he heterochromatic states which can either activate or silence the given gene by uh, by acetylation or deacetylation of the histones. And these histone modifications are also very crucial in keeping the cell in a dormant or in an active state. The mRNA silencing by microRNAs has been extensively evolved in the recent years. And uh, I will also try and give you some example on this. Um, so why copy number variation is so very important in order for us to understand how the cancer progression in fact can occur. These copy number variations have a significant effect not only on the methylation of a given gene or the gene expression which is driven by the methylation of the given gene and also on the microRNAs, the small RNAs which are produced by this given cell and associated non-long coding RNAs which are within the cell. All of them are uh, play a significant role on the different stages of progression of the tumor in a given cells or a given organs. These, in fact, can lead to aberrant protein expression, and I will provide you with some specific examples subsequently. And this aberrant protein expression leads to altered metabolites, and all of them together can, in fact, can, can contribute to the genesis of the cancer. Now, to understand how the copy number changes are, in fact, are influencing the methylation or miRNA or link RNA expression, and thereby bringing about these changes, it is very important to understand what copy number changes are in fact are, uh, are and how do they uh, alter the gene expression or methylation levels or even the gene expression of microRNAs within a given cell or in a given tissue. So we can see we have a different type of copy number variation that in fact are existing in a given cell. You can have a copy number gain wherein you have an addition of an uh, extra segment of the gene is introduced into the cell as a part of the whole gene or you can also have a copy number loss in which a specific segment is lost within the given, uh, given gene. And this can happen across the entire gene. This event happening in the entire gene is advantageous to the given cell to attain a specific phenotype and that would contribute to the disrupted homeostasis. It can also ha happen uh, partially within a given gene wherein a single exon or a single event a small deletion uh, or amplification can occur within the gene. It can also ha happen continuously across many genes. In other words, over a large segment of the genome, this can occur and it can amplify or delete at the multiple places. 
And this can also happen not only within the genes, but also at the regulatory regions. That is the promoters and uh, LCRs and so on and so forth, where amplification or the deletion of the regulatory, uh, regulatory sequences within the genes can gives rise, gives rise to altered gene expression. So uh, what, uh, what I'm going to do is give you examples of uh, our own studies and also from the literature to tell you how copy number variations are going to influence uh, have an effect on the given cell. I'm also going to give you an example on how DNA methylation influences the tumor progression. And I will end with telling you something about the microRNA and how these microRNAs can influence the tumor progression. In most of these cases, I will try and give you our own examples of these findings. So as a part of the major Indian genome project effort from the government of, government of India, from Department of Biotechnology, we embarked on preparing a large human genome library of an Indian male, which we call it as Indian male back library using the back, uh, back vectors to do a construction. And these back uh, libraries were in fact were cloned and then they were screened and then they were analyzed and the sequencing was performed. And this is now available, available as a resource for the Indian population to be able to use for whatever may be their purposes. Here is some examples of uh, the back library which has been uh, prepared uh, from the Indian male genome which is used for the sequencing. And there are approximately about 100,000 clones which are in fact are made as a part of the library. And these are some of the specific examples of the genes which have been identified within the library to show that uh, to show that these are well represented by uh, several genes which are in notation. So one of the aim was to be able to identify the precise copy number changes within the human genome in the Indian uh, Indian genome sequences. So if we when we analyzed for the copy number variations, we found that majority of the CNVs are within the range of about one to one KB, one based one KB in size, and there are. Uh, as the size becomes higher and higher, the number of CNVs are in fact are decreased. Although we find that compared to the reported sequences, we find significantly less number of copy number variation in the Indian genome. At the same time, if you look at the copy number gain or the copy number loss within the genome studies, as they are spread across the entire human genome, and this provides a very valuable information. We know that the chromosomes are different and they're classified. One of the classification criteria is the size of the chromosome. And as the size of the chromosome decreases, the copy number variations in relation to the gain and also loss are also decreased. Chromosome one, which is the largest one, which appears to be having the large number of gains and losses. Although chromosome, although the chromosome uh, six is in fact is very um, smaller than the chromosome one, we find the significant uh, CNV loss in these chromosomes, and that in fact tells us that how the population differences among the individuals and across the population are in fact are happening in a given uh, given individual or in a given tissue. So, uh, using ideograms, we in fact can map the each copy number variations in relation to their losses or the gains into every single chromosome. And what is shown here in the red and in the blue are in fact are the gains and the losses which we see in the genome as we compare in relation to how it looks in various other genomes. So what did we understand in relation to CNVRs in, 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 in the genome? We find that there are disease associated genes are altered. The total number of events which occur on an average in a genome is indicated here in this column and we have um, about um, um, uh, eight cancer associated genes which we have discovered with the loss. Uh, there are approximately about uh, uh, 28,000 CPG islands which have been described. CPG islands are nothing but a CPG rich sequences which are present within the genome and uh, the CPG islands are represented approximately 96 of them in our genome. Similarly, we identified the microRNAs associated with the CNVs and uh, disease associated genes from online Mendelian inherited genes and pharmacogenetic genes. And so these pharmacogenetic genes are important in relation to being able to provide appropriate drugs for the treatment of an individual. So it is very important to know the genes which are associated with the pharmacogenomic events. And we were able to identify these features of losses and gains in, this, uh, in these individuals. We also have uh, discovered the imprinted genes, for example, as it is shown here below. 
this data uh, uh, paper have already been published in the international journal so let me come back to um, uh, let me come back to an example of a cancer which is associated with the copy number variation we know that the ulcerative colitis which happens in the colon is in fact is an inflammatory disease there is an inflammatory disorder and over a period of time anywhere between year to 12 years ulcerative colitis can lead to colorectal cancer so during the process of ulcerative colitis there are number of events which have already been described because ulcerative colitis can give rise to low grade dysplasia and this can turn into high grade dysplasia and then number of genes which are associated with these stages have already been identified and that is how it is termed as ulcerative colitis associated colorectal cancer there are also sporadic colorectal cancer which occur majority of the times which is different from the colitis associated colorectal cancer so the anoplyde is very common at the uh, at the uh, colon cancer colorectal cancer uh, genesis or tumorigenesis which you can see at the even at the early anadoma as well as intermediate adenoma and the number of genes which are associated with the sporadic progression of the sporadic colorectal cancer has also been identified so plus or minus is basically into loss of the gain of the gene copies or the copy number variations so we just focused on ulcerative colitis to understand the copy number variations and then associated with the uh, colorectal cancer to compare the differences between the copy number variations between these two so we asked the questions are cnvs associated with the development of pathogenesis of uh, colorectal cancers which is associated with the ulcerative colitis whether it is low risk or the high risk or the pre malignant lesion or the uh, colorectal cancer which arose from the ulcerative colitis as opposed to sporadic adenomas and squamous cell um, sporadic colorectal cancers what is given here is a snapshot of large amount of data which we have generated over the period of years to indicate that the kind of copy number variation that occurs across the entire genome so um, these are distributed in relation to uh, uh, in relation to different chromosomes as it is shown uh, earlier chromosome 1 is the largest but interestingly as we saw earlier in the normal individual it is in fact the chromosome 15 which appears to have high copy number variation as opposed to chromosome 1 although it is nearly x times smaller than the chromosome 1 similarly we can also see the differences in other chromosomes regardless of the size of the chromosomes suggesting that the copy number variation in the disease status is altered by disrupting the homeostasis in such a way that to bring about increases in the dna copies and thereby allowing it to progress into a cancer and unlike what we saw in the normal individual where the cnvs which are altered only at the small size of about 1 kb or less we find that it is in fact between 1 to 5 kb of the copy number regions are associated with the colorectal cancer progression so again we find a differences in the region of the size of the cnv which is in fact are amplified now among all of these we can classify them based on their specificity whether they are specifically present in uh, low risk or the high risk or pre malignant or the colorectal cancers using this kind of a diagram and then we have identified specific regions within the genome that are altered during the colorectal cancer progression either sporadically or through the ulcerative colitis the venn diagram on the left on the right uh, indicate the regions what is shown in the outer periphery are the chromosome numbers and what is shown in the in, uh, inside the periphery are the grains and the losses within the chromosomes and in relation to their density within each chromosome so as it is evident from the venn di uh, uh, circles diagram as well as the distribution across various stages of colon cancer we see that the regions of copy number variation that occur Uh, differently in both in colorectal cancers or during the progression of ulcerative cancer ulcerative colitis as well we can also map them across the chromosomes to the ideogram that is indicated here so we have the regions um, uh, regions which are shown in the triangles that represent those occur in the colorectal cancers and the green uh, squares which occur in the pre malignant lesions and the blue circles are indicated by non normal tissues wherein the alterations of the gross chromosomal abnormalities can also be mapped through this high throughput analysis
So this process has uh, given us uh, several genes which are associated with these copy number variations. Despite the presence uh, of the gene density, high gene density, as well as the size of approximately about 5 to 5 to 20 kilobases in size, we are able to identify several genes which are associated with the copy numbers. For example, there are nine regions which are common across all the stages of the uh, colorectal cancer progression, while there are approximately 29, can 29 genes are identified which are specifically associated with the pre-malignant region. This becomes very important to study because these are presumably, presumably are the genes which are responsible for um, responsible for pushing the cells into the higher or the more aggressive state. Similarly, we also have identified number of oncogenes, which is listed here, uh, about 34 of them, and many of them have already been identified and well characterized, and we were also able to identify new genes. So this also led us to uh, understand how or what are the oncogenes and the tumor suppressor genes are in fact are mutated in the colorectal cancer. The uh, exome sequencing has gave us a very strong indication that the type of genes which are mutated and they're promoting the progression of the co uh, colorectal cancer. The black indicates the truncation mutation and the blue indicate the missense mutation. One of the frequently identified mutations which we see across all the samples, a large number of samples which have analyzed is in the FGFR3, fibroblast growth factor receptor 3, PDGF uh, receptor RA is also highly uh, uh, mutated, which we find in the colorectal cancer. And then there are other series of other genes, including KRAS, AKT, uh, cyclin D, and so on and so forth, are also mutated. Similarly, these mutations can be activating mutations, whereby mutation can lead to higher character biological function of these genes. On the other hand, if you look into the tumor suppressor genes, where a mutation can inactivate these genes. So inactivation leads to their lack of control over the growth of the cells, so that the oncogenes would, would take over and then make the cells proliferate in these colorectal cancers. We have identified some very interesting genes within the, uh, uh, within the uh, within the colorectal cancers, the tumors, uh, which have mutated in relation to the tumor suppression, uh, tumor suppressor genes, thereby indicating that uh, these genes are in fact have lost their function to act as a tumor suppressor genes. So this is a, basically a representation of the genes which wherein we can identify both oncogenes as well as the tumor suppressor genes that occur within the each sample or individual sample to be able to tell which is the dominating factor in being able to progress the tumor progression. So um, some of the mutations which we identified is indicated here uh, in the APC gene, AKT gene, and FGFR3 gene, R2 gene, and PIT3 as kinase gene, where they are all appear to be mutated in the very critical region within the given gene and thereby bringing about activation of genes as an oncogenes or inactivation of the genes as a tumor suppressor genes. Um, we can also further classify as those uh, genes which either occur as those responsible for the progression of ulcerative colitis into colorectal cancers or those which prevent them from going, um, uh, going forward into a colon cancer. So these are potentially, potentially are tumor suppressors. The very important gene which we identified is ARID1A, ATRX and EP300 and also KMT2C, which is in fact is a chromatin modifier. And those which are responsible for uh, uh, progression are also indicated here in relation to their inactivating function. So when these are inactivated, tumors are in fact are progressed further. And these have already been uh, published uh, in both in the Journal of Cancer as well as the BNP Cancer recently. So let me uh, come back to the second epigenetic factor, which is in fact is influenced by copy number variations or the CNBs. So uh, as I mentioned before, DNA methylation is a key event in the cellular um, progression into any given phenotype and is even more important as far as the tumor progression is concerned. A normal cell, which is, you know, when it is uh, uh, hypermethylated and the tumor cells, the same set of genes can be hypo, uh, hypomethylated. So once they are, when they are hypomethylated, gene activation occurs. So that is the example which is shown here. So when it is hypermethylation, there is a gene inactivation occurs. So the gene which is hypermethylated and during the progression of the cancer can become hypomethylation and then can give rise to the gene, can cause the gene expression. Similarly, a hypermethylated region 
can uh, uh, become hypermethylated in the tumors and they can act as a tumor suppressors within the given gene. Because as we indicated before, the methylation very critically controls how the tumor is in fact uh, expresses several groups of these genes which are present within the cell. So these can occur within the single copy genes, these can occur within the repetitive sequences and these can occur within the CPG islands. As I mentioned, there are about 28,000 CPG islands which are in fact are present in the cell and this, these are discreetly distributed across the genome. So the functional consequences of the DNA methylation are several. These are indicated here both at the biochemical level, molecular level as well as at the organismal levels. We have, we have the difference in the van der Waal radius. Once it is methylated at the cytosol residue, DNA structure is significantly altered. DNA bending on the nucleosome uh, takes place because of addition of a methyl group and the uh, DNA binding proteins or the transcription factors do not bind to those regions which are methylated as well as it promotes the binding of methylation specific proteins such as MBD into these sites. And these have significant effect on chromatin compaction, subcellular loculation, transcription of a given gene, RNA transcription as well as metabolism, DNA replication at the specific origin of replication sites and also silencing of certain genes. Some of the events which are associated with the organism at the organism level, including imprinting silencing or altered imprinting of the genes, which are in fact are maternally or paternally inherited genes, altered developmental processes, altered pluripotency of the cells, inability or excessive differentiation into specific type of cells and also for the tumoral genesis. There is a lot of literature in this field which is available and those of you interested can easily can look up. So our basic criteria was to be able to look at what is the interrelationship between the epigenetic events and the genetic events. As I mentioned before, the genetic events such as copy number variations have significant impact on the epigenetic events and we use uh, next generation sequencing as well as microarray technology to be able to elucidate and further characterize these specific events which are interdependent on each other during the progression of the tumor and we perform the data analysis of the large set of data which allows us to identify the candidate genes and these can be either used as a uh, uh, biomarker or these can also be used as used as markers for early detection of the diagnosis or even as a target for the therapeutic purposes. One of the examples which I am going to tell you right now is about the cervical cancer, uh, cervical cancer progression model where we have initiation, promotion and progression are broadly classified into SYN1, SYN2 and invasive carcinomas from the normal cervix and majority of the time it is in fact is uh, initiated or uh, HPV human papilloma virus is in fact is responsible for pushing the cells into various stages of progression. So like any other tumor, <coughs> cervical cancer also involves the tumor suppressor gene inactivation, apoptosis gene activation, cell cycle regulatory genes which are altered, DNA repair genes which are misplaced as well as activation of the certain transcription factors. So these are the events which are observed in every single type of the tumors. However, the, the genes which are responsible for activation or inactivation or bringing about this function may be different between different cancers. And that is how that's what uh, DNA methylation or microRNA regulation can be uh, important to be able to understand their functions and as a target for therapy or even for diagnostic purposes. So the progression cervical cancer progression model would involve again specific genes which are either hypomethylated or hypermethylated and driven by the interaction with the HPV. So uh, more often we look into a uh, the chip analysis in which we look into approximately about 200,000 200, CPG uh, sequences spanning 28,000 CPG islands and which also covers microRNA sequencing and their promoter analysis and then which are associated even with the CPG shores. So this kind of uh, uh, chip analysis which includes upstream promoter regions, exons, introns as well as three prime untranslated region even spanning in the gene body with more than uh, more than one MB uh, it can also be analyzed using chip analysis and here is the typical analysis typical picture. So our analysis in fact identified number of genes which are either hypomethylated or hypermethylated as shown in the Venn diagram. 
and the circles diagram also indicates in this chromosome specifically in the specific region that can be uh, identified. So the upper panel is the hypermethylated regions between the pre-malignant and malignant samples and the lower panel is for the hypomethylated sequences between the pre-malignant and mal malignant branch samples. So as you can see, there are a large number of genes which are differentially uh, methylated between these two groups and these are in fact are the excellent resources for discovery of new genes which are associated specifically with the given tumor and thereby providing it as either diagnostic and prognostic marker and I'll give you some examples. So we went on to identify number of genes which are differentially methylated in the cervical cancer. What is shown here is a cluster diagram which indicate the extent, the blue indicates the low expression, red indicates the high expression of genes which are indicated here and they provide uh, even more about approximately 98% sensitivity and specificity uh, to be able to distinguish between the malignant, the pre-malignant and the normal sequences and that is what indicated here in the setup sequence. So these very genes we took forward and to be able to develop the diagnostic test which is indicated here using the uh, nanoparticles and what you see in the red is in fact is the control and what you see in the blue are the tumor cells which are uh, identified of the cervical cancer suggesting a very rapid and very robust way of detecting cervical cancer without having to undergo invasive procedures and that is the advantage of uh, being able to identify the genes and then subsequently translate that into for the diagnostic purposes. We, this also led us to characterize uh, uh, characterize genes which are uh, uh, which are act as a tumor suppressor and one of the tumor suppressor which we identified was uh, uh, doc 2 b which is in fact is a protein which is associated with the several function of the tumor cells of a given cell and it is in fact is also associated with the exocytosis process and this tumor uh, it also acts as a tumor growth regulator and that is what we discovered by identifying this doc 2 b gene we saw that the promoter of this gene is significantly uh, significantly methylated uh, uh, in the in the tumor cells as opposed to uh, as opposed to in the normals which is indicated here and also it is also methylated uh, by performing the rtpcr analysis and then in turn that in, in fact gives rise to the expression in the normal cells as opposed to the tumor cells and by performing the sequence analysis we are also able to identify specific CPGs which are in fact are methylated in the tumor cells. So that is how we deduce them as a tumor uh, suppress, suppressor function. <clears throat> okay, I think I have a, I have a crash. So I have to get back to this uh, crash in the uh, system and what happened. No problem, sir. Your lecture was going so amazing. We are enjoying civic. So just give me a second. Sorry for this disruption. I think no. No issues, sir. No issues. It's okay, sir. It's okay, sir. It was fine. Okay. So uh, I was just mentioning about the protein, the Dr. V, which we have identified, and we find that it is in fact. When we overexpress this protein, it is able to effectively inhibit the growth of the tumor uh, in vitro. Uh, their proliferation and the doubling time uh, decreases. 
Similarly, uh, when we put that into the nude mice, the human tumors, when we put in the nude mice, it is also able to significantly show decreased uh, uh, decreased size of the tumors, as that is shown here. And what we also able to indicate uh, and show that it also significantly able to inhibit the metastasis. So this is the kind of information which one can get by looking at uh, the mechanisms and the functions of a given gene in which we have identified a, a new gene, which is in fact is acts as a tumor suppressor as well as inhibits the tumor growth. So uh, we did a similar analysis in relation to the breast cancer. Uh, breast cancer is also most uh, through the uh, series of experimentally defined tumor progression uh, stages. Uh, from uh, typical uh, ductal, atypical ductal hyperplasia to ductal in situ carcinoma in situ and invasive ductal carcinomas and subsequently leading to metastasis. So uh, the cluster analysis of the breast cancer, uh, breast cancer sample tissue specimens from the patients identified a beautiful uh, hypomethylated region as it is indicated here and the hypermethylated regions that is indicated here. And these are the associated genes of these hypo and hypermethylated genes are beautiful examples of how these can be exploited for the managing a given disease. Some of the genes which have identified is indicated here in this, um, uh, again is the uh, cluster diagram in this uh, hierarchical cluster diagram and where the genes can be hypomethylated as well as the hypermethylated. And now these are being used for early diagnosis of uh, breast cancers of a various origin, uh, both hormone sensitive and hormone insensitive, as well as during the pre and post menopausal stage. Uh, this also gave us a handle on the potential mechanism by which uh, how the breast cancer is in fact is progressing uh, uh, using the transcriptional regulation as its regulators and we identify a master gene that CCND is one which is in fact is controlled and interacting through the gene gene interaction and the gene protein interaction across various proteins within the cells and thereby allowing the tumor cells to progress. And this also has been published very uh, recently. Coming back in the next few five minutes, uh, which I have, five to six minutes I have, I'll briefly describe another epigenetic, the last epigenetic event that is on uh, microRNA, uh, which are in fact are produced within the cell. And these microRNAs are nothing but um, the small single stranded nucleotides of size of approximately about 21 to 22 bases in uh, bases in size. The first discovered way back in 1993 in uh, in CL, I guess, by Andrew Fire and who got Nobel Prize subsequently for their uh, discovery. So so far we have approximately about 2,000 of these microRNAs, which have been identified and that's already present in the database, and they have been known to significantly alter various functions uh, within the given cell. So uh, there are multiple microRNAs which interact with the given gene. It's not a single microRNA which works with a single gene, but multiple microRNAs interact with the sing multiple uh, single gene and thereby bringing about almost any event which you can think of within a given cell. So these are easily regulatable events. They in fact are produced from the nucleus through RNA polymerase 2 or 3 based transcription and uh, as a pre microRNAs and these are then subsequently cleaved and through a series of complexes of the proteins which identifies its targets and subsequently they promote them for uh, degradation. So um, now recently there are a number of clinical trials which are currently underway using anti-MIR as a therapeutics, microRNAs are therapeutics for a heart failure, for metabolic disorders, for even viral infections, and also for inflammation, atherosclerosis, as well as for the cardiovascular diseases. So some of these microRNAs are also currently in the clinical trial. So how do you discover that? So we set about identifying microRNAs in the cervical cancer. Basically, we isolate uh, the RNA, small RNA, and subject them to next generation sequencing. And then once the sequencing is uh, now once the sequencing is done, then we identify differentially expressed uh, microRNAs, and that is in fact is shown here. So uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, diagram, in the volcano plot, on the left hand side is the one which is for um, uh, underexpressed as well as the overexpressed on the right hand side, and then we can uh, we can we can analyze the differences between either squamous cell carcinomas or normal epithelial cells, and then identify those microRNAs which are specifically e expressed or not expressed in each of these progression stages of the cervical cancer. 
the CC stands for squamous carcinoma, uh, and the NC is for normal cervical epithelium. And then this gives us an idea about the number of microRNA that may be differentially expressed between these tissues. So we can also analyze them for their location in relation to the copy number variations, and that is uh, that is in fact is uh, shown here. And the location of these microRNAs can be put uh, can be mapped against each chromosome in the form of an ideogram, and then their methylation status itself, whether they're hypomethylated or hyper hypermethylated, can also be analyzed based on the expression pattern, combining with the DNA methylation analysis to identify the specific CPG island that may be regulating these microRNAs. So uh, what it has given us is majority of the microRNAs we have identified. Along with that, we identified other RNAs, including link RNA and um, uh, snow RNA, so on and so forth, are also identified. And then these uh, RNAs can be distinguished based on their abundance within the given tissue, whether it's a squamous cell carcinoma or it is a normal tissue, which can be analyzed. They also can be compared in relation to the respective tissues. Whether it is uh, uh, whether they are spread across the chromosomes and different regions of the chromosomes, and uh, this volcano plot is in fact provides within the tissues which we have analyzed those which are comparatively in relation to their counterparts, whether they are underexpressed or the overexpressed. And once we identify these, can be uh, further analyzed for their utility in relation to the tumor progression. In this case, the cervical cancer. In fact, many of these microRNAs they occur in the form of clusters. The clusters definition means that multiple microRNAs are located one after the other um, within the same given uh, genomic region within the chromosomes. And these, in fact, are also regulated uh, together by a single promoter. So their expression pattern also can appear and change within, uh, within themselves within the progression of uh, uh, during the progression of a given tumor. And these clusters uh, cluster microRNAs are because of their co-expression co and the number of microRNAs which are also associated with the clustered RNAs, microRNAs can bring about a significant phenotypic changes similar to what we, what we see with the copy number variations. So once you identify that, it is very important to be able to uh, validate them uh, experimentally and that we did that in relation to the tumors derived from the patients and all of those microRNAs which are identified either as um, activated or inhibited by methylation, which is in fact is shown here. In the squamous cell carcinoma, we find a higher expression of MIR-17 uh, compared to the normal cells. Here is an example of MIR-409 uh, in squamous cell carcinoma. It is uh, decreased. It may act as a tumor suppressor by regulating the genes uh, which are associated with the microRNA and similarly for other microRNAs, which is uh, uh, validated from the uh, next generation genome sequencing to be able to indicate whether they are in fact are um, reproducible in a given sample or not. <clears throat> so in order to uh, correlate in relation of the methylation in respect to their uh, expression, we find that the, those genes which are in fact are methylated or, uh, or the set of uh, microRNAs, their expression is also altered. So the uh, hyper uh, hypomethylated uh, microRNAs expressions are high, hypermethylated hypermethylated microRNAs whose expressions are lower. And similarly, you can see that the, the methylation uh, uh, inhibition in the SYN3, you find the decreased expression as well as increased expression once they are hypermethylated. So there appears to be a strong correlation between um, methylation of the microRNA promoters and the microRNA expression as we, as we combine the data from DNA methylation, copy number variation, as well as the miRNA expression through the next generation sequencing. As I mentioned, uh, these are targeted for specific genes. In this case, we validated few genes to show that whether they're actually functional or not. The HIPK3 and the RABBP6 are the two genes which we picked for the analysis uh, to show that their expression patterns are decreased in relation to the microRNAs, in fact, are targeting them, and hence their expression is also higher. So, um, Many of these are in fact are uh, published in the uh, literature in the recent times and you can find them which is publicly available as well as uh, we can provide you this information and uh, uh, this also the some of the papers which related to cervical cancer which I described very briefly without going into the details uh, in the previous few slides. Um, I must acknowledge uh, our most uh, valuable clinical collaborators 
Dr. Kustaki and Diksha Pandey, Dr. Banerjee and Dr. Krishna Saran, who have been working with us for the several years to work on colon cancer, breast cancer, cervical cancer, and oral cancer, the data which I have not presented here, and also our graduate students. Um, Sandeep Malia is in fact is a bioinformatics specialist, uh, Vinay and Vaibo who got graduated recently, Sham and Samatha, they all have in fact worked with us in the process of being able to generate this data and uh, uh, all of this work was not possible without the collaboration of large number of PhD scholars as well as clinical collaborators and of course the funding from uh, Government of India and from the various funding agencies. Thank you very much. And uh, I stop my talk and if you have any queries, I'll be happy to take. So, thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was really a very nice session you had. Um, you have shared your knowledge related to the topic targeting epigen uh, epigenetics for disrupted hemostatuses in cancer. So uh, it, it was really a nice session and uh, as well as you have shared your uh, various research findings in the in this area. Uh, this will definitely help our research fellows to work in this field uh, going forward uh, in cancer therapy. So thank you so much, sir. So if, if anyone have any queries related to that, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, uh, you can write your queries in the chat box on uh, all the relatives. Uh, so we have one question, sir, uh, which Abhijit wants to ask. Uh, that is, what is, our, uh, what is your opinion on DNA and RNA-based suppressor elements for cancer in the era of immun uh, immunotherapy? Yeah, so that's a, uh, that's a good question. So. Uh, obviously, the DNA and RNA are very critically involved in the uh, tumorogenic process, both of the cellular origin as well as, uh, uh, let us say, bacterial or viral origin. There are specific responses which are generated uh, uh, within the cell, and these responses are related to signaling pathways associated with the DNA or the RNA, whether it is uh, present in the cytoplasm, that is deemed to be foreign to the given cell. That is not innate to the given cell, but on the contrary, it is foreign to the given cell. So these uh, elicit specific interferon mediated uh, uh, responses, and they can in turn activate immune cells to be able to eliminate the host cells, or even being able to take care of the invaded DNA or the RNA. So uh, it is an up and coming field, and we see especially now for the COVID RNA vaccines are working very well, and that is induces a robust immune response in the, in the individual who are vaccinated. And the concept which has been there, now it has been put into practice. And the case of tumor, this is being evolved, it is being done. There are many therapeutic companies which are currently uh, looking after the success of what we have seen with the vaccine with the uh, COVID viruses. And in the coming years, I'm sure that we'll be able to see some exciting new targets, uh, which is going to help us uh, in being able to look into their immune effectors, what we call it as an immune effectors. So uh, it's a very important area, very good area, very futuristic area to work at right now. Yes. You are muted, uh, Dr. Monica. Thank you so much, sir. I uh, hope so. Abhijit must be satisfied with the answer. So uh, next question, one more question we have uh, from Priya Korwal. She wants to ask, what are the reasons for breast cancer? Can you repeat the question, please? What are the reasons for breast cancer? Yes, yes. So there are uh, basically there are two ways one looks into the uh, breast carcinogenesis or a breast cancer. One that is involves uh, uh, familial, familial means which is inherited uh, within the family and which is passed on from generation to generation. And that happens because of the mutations in the specific genes which are also inherited. The most common gene which has been identified to be mutated is called the BRCA gene, the breast cancer associated gene one and two. Uh, that is uh, uh, where, where the people have tendency to, uh, uh, sorry, where the uh, where one the mutated gene from the uh, family uh, once it is passed on from the um, mother to the children, um, it has a propensity to develop a tumor during the course of one's lifetime. Although we cannot tell the rate of their penetrance, 
in the sense that when exactly the tumor would come, but uh, uh, BRCA genes are supposed to promote the tumorogenesis in a familial setting. In other words, transmitted from generation to generation. In the sporadic cancers, there are a number of reasons which have been identified. Mostly it is related, uh, currently it is un, uh, related to hormonal variations as well as the extrinsic and intrinsic factors that control the gene expression within a given uh, within a given um, uh, organ or organ, for example, in this case, uh, breast cancer. So um, there are instances of uh, viruses which are causing the breast cancer, hormonal variations which are causing the breast cancer, and the mutations which occur because of uh, a number of factors, both can induce as well as stress-related stress factors, which can also give rise to breast cancer. So. Uh, uh, the current hypothesis, which is kind of people are actively exploring since about last two years for the origin of breast cancer in the sporadic tumors is on the inflammation based, uh, inflammatory mediated progression. So that is in a very attractive field which is coming up and mutations in the inflammatory genes have been identified. And uh, I think we are, uh, we will expect to see some exciting findings in the coming months or the years in this field. Yes. Sir, um, are there any preventive measures for uh, this type if it is hereditary or something? So yes, so yes, yes. As you as you know, madam, that uh, that uh, the tumor does not happen arise by itself. Now one can yes. either delay or one they can completely eliminate the cancer from happening. So in order to uh, in order to do that, one needs to have a lifestyle conditions uh, which are most appropriate to be able to maintain a healthy state. Mm -hmm. And also regular checkup that will also help. So um, health, health as a definition is different between different people. So you cannot really tell what is health to one and what is not health to another. But it is sufficient to say that a healthy lifestyle, however one, uh, however one wants to define, and if that is maintained, for example, uh, um, uh, reducing the lipid-based diet. You know, high-fat diet is reduced. No smoking, no drinking, and have a uh, life without the stress and take care of yourself uh, and um, uh, watch out for those uh, familial uh, mutated genes that be present by testing your gene. All of this can uh, prevent control uh, genesis of uh, breast cancer in this case. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, one more question I have uh, which I want to ask that can we identify at early stages that, uh, or, uh, that ulcerative colitis can lead to colorectal cancer. Yes, yes, that's a, that is the whole idea of uh, our study which we have done. That uh, although the percentage of people who progress into colorectal cancer is not very high, uh, because most of the time, uh, just to reassure you that co uh, ulcerative colitis regresses back and not necessarily have a tumor. But approximately about 6 to 7 percent of the people, this can progress into colorectal cancer. And that is the reason why we identified uh, six which are potential indicators of uh, uh, predicting the colon cancer uh, or the sporadic colon cancer formation. And these sequences are now currently being tested uh, for their utility in being able to identify their ability to progress into a colon cancer. So the chances are that these are working with the high specificity and sensitivity. And uh, these are now being tested clinically to show their utility and then one would be able to do that in the new future. That's great. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir. So now uh, I would like Sheikha Man to introduce our third guest, the third guest speaker of the day. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>